morning, good morning, good morning. Once again, God has blessed us to be able to come together once again. Uh, on the day of taping, which we're doing now, we experience a little bit of bad weather, so you may hear a few things, but we're still going to go on and do what we have to do. Uh, and thank God for this opportunity once again. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer as we get into, when we get into our lesson. Tell God it's once again that you have blessed us and you kept us, and we thank you, Lord, to come around once again and be able to have the opportunity to study your word. And we pray that each and every occasion that we have to do this, we will grow and we will prosper and we will learn more about Christ and we will pattern our lives more after Christ too for those things we learn and understand the things that we should and should not do as we study your word. We thank you. We give you the glory, honor, and praise. Now open us up and pour into us, O oh Lord, all that we need at this time and what you give us in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, our lesson is coming today from Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, um, starting with the second verse, and we'll, we'll skip through the whole chapter, uh, then six and seventh verses, then nine through 10, and then 30 through 36. Uh, our lesson title today is Community of Confession. And as I said, it's a lot, not only when one person does it, but when the community does it and realize how they, we have fallen short of God's glory and uh, that we need to come back to God and to um, uh, do those things that he has required for us to do. So God has been very good to us, all of us, and uh, we just need to understand that. Uh, our lesson just really continues on from last week. Uh, if you remember, if you studied last week, I had an opportunity to look at the eighth chapter of Nehemiah. You'll see that what happened in the eighth chapter as we uh, was closing out, uh, the people were celebrating the Day of Atonement, but as they continued to read the Word of God as Ezra stood up before the people, they realized that there was another festival that they needed to keep as well, too, that they had learned about. It's called the Feast of the Booth or the Tabernacle. And that was a, uh, a celebration that commemorated that uh, when they were out in the wilderness coming from well, Egypt, that they had to make temporary booths or shelters, which reminded them and helped them to understand uh, how God kept them through the whole wilderness experience all the way into the promised land. So that was an annual celebration that the Jews went through as well too, the Feast of Booths or the Tabernacle. Uh, and they found out, and when they did that, they only had a short period of time to get it out through the cities and through all the people, but they worked together. And that shows the power of the church when we can come together and work together for one, on one accord and for one mission in mind and be in one mind, we can do a lot of great things as they did here. So everybody was able to celebrate uh, the festival of, uh, of booths, tabernacles, and, uh, and, and uh, they were able to do and keep what the law had required. So as we pick up, we pick it up on the, on, on the following right after this situation, the celebration just ended. And we're going to see what the people, because the people are just really excited about hearing the word and, and understanding what God has for them and what he wanted for them to do. And everybody was willing to do that. Because you have to remember now, it's taken almost 100 years since the time, for, since Zerubbabel until Nehemiah coming uh, from the building of the temple. Uh, I should say the, the building of the temple, or the restoring of the spiritual condition of the Ezra. Uh, and then the building of the city walls under Nehemiah, that's a long time. So now the people are finally at a good place and they're able to understand and realize what God has for them to do by reading the word. Because remember, these people have been in captivity for a long time and uh, coming back and the word is something that they just didn't have and they didn't understand. So now they're reading it, they're understanding it, and they are no uh, they know exactly, I would say they didn't know all the things that the word has for them to do in captivity, but now they're coming back and understanding what uh, God has for them through the word. And now they're willing to do those things which God has designed for them to do. So let's pick up in, in chapter nine, because like I say, we're coming off uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles and uh, uh, the Festival of the Tabernacles, I should say, and uh, the Feast of Booths, where they celebrated that. And we're going to still see the continued response for the people as they still happen. We're going to see what they decide to do. So our lesson picks up in the second chapter of verse 9. But I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 to kind of give us a good foundation coming into chapter 9. And it reads like this. 
It says, now in the 24th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. Now, the scene has changed. This is the aftermath of, of, of a coming uh, uh, behind the Feast of the Tabernacles. And once were uh, eating and feasting and doing great things, now they decide to fast and put sackcloth and ashes, which is a sign of humility. So the whole scene is being changed now because of the things that commit recommitting themselves to the Lord too, uh, as they as they read the word and find out what needs to happen. Verse two says this, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their places and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So that's a long time. We're going we're gonna to talk about these time frames. That's why I wanted to read verses three specifically because we could see that they, they spent a, a, a really great number of hours in a day worshiping and studying. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Listen to this. The Feast of the Tabernacles had ended, which we just stated, but the people lingered to hear more of the word of God. Fasting had turned, I mean, excuse me, feasting had turned into fasting as the word brought conviction and the people started confessing their sins. In most churches today, a six hour service, three hours of preaching, which is the fourth part, and three hours of praying will probably result in some requests for resignations. But to the Jewish people um, in, in that day, it was the beginning of a new life for them and their city. So we could see that they were so enthused and so enjoyed and so into to, to under, uh, the great feeling of understanding what the word was teaching them and showing them that they just they just they just stood in church for a long we you know stood in church long day six hours and like I say again that's all to say is six hours a day standing in the service uh, you're gonna hear probably no doubt a lot of grumbling and complaining because of the length of the service I mean if we stand in, in service a couple of hours hour and a half two hours that that that's basically sufficient for what we do today. Things have changed, and, and, and it really has evolved into a, a different setting and a different way of doing things when it comes to worship. But we can see that the people of God stood out there for six hours with preaching and praying and coming together uh, in order to, 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 to uh, bring all, absorb all this good stuff that they're learning from the Word of God as it's being read. Again, that's why I say it's so important for us to read the Word of God because that's where we get our strength, our help, our direction. And, and it's where we understand what God has for us to do in this life. By reading his word and understanding what the power of the Holy Spirit does in our lives, we can see that through the word that we gain a lot of insight, strength, protection, and all that we need to help us along this way. So the people are still up. They're still learning. They're still growing. They're still ready to give themselves back to God. <laughs> For all this time they have been away and not doing those things that God has required for them to do while they were in captivity and just even before they had been disobedient from their forefathers. And we're going to see what they say about them in just a minute, that they were willing now to come back and start doing everything as they should have. So this is so we're going to see what they need to what they started to do as a result of learning and growing and understanding what God's word had for them to do. Now, let's, that's what we pick up in verse 2. And this is what it says. By, by them listening to the word, understanding what the word says, how they need to change their life, what God expected from them to do, this is what they did. Look at verse 2, and it says this. It says, And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their father. Now, the first thing they did once learning the word of God and once learning how short they had fallen, Look what the word says, and it says, and they separated themselves. And what does that, what is that saying? God commanded, God commanded separateness from other people, not because Israel was superior to those other people, quite the opposite. He knew Israel's weaknesses and how quickly they would fall into idolatry if they were with the nations around them. The answer goes all the way back to Leviticus 2026, 20, at the time when Israel was formed, 
And this is what it says, and ye shall be holy unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that you should what, be mine. This is what we have to understand. The church uh, is, is separate from the world, which simply means we, we live a different way in a different life. And this is why uh, God wanted Israel not to mix, mangle, or marry with other nations around them. Because just like it was stated, God knew that in that, that some kind of way those other nations would get them to fall away from him and start going back and start going and wishing idols and doing things that God did not prescribe for them to do in their relationship with him. And it's always funny that, you know, it, when you get a, a Christian and, and a group of unchristian people, and somehow we're another, we start falling to their ways well than then them join to us as, as we should because we want to fit in and we want to be a part of the crowd. But we just have to learn to stand strong and do those things that God asked us to do. So what did they do as they started to learn the word of God and got convicted in their spirits of what they have fallen short of, they learned to separate themselves or they learned to begin now to pull away from all those strange, what it said, separate them saying, from the strangers and stood and confessed them sin. They, they, they had to pull away. You, you can't be in Christ and be connected to the world all at the same time. That, that, that's just, you just can't do that and be right about it. So they begin to separate themselves from those things that previously hindered or kept them from doing what God will have them to do. And that's the same thing we have to do in our life. Anything, anybody, or, or whatever we do in life once we come in Christ, we have to learn how to separate ourselves from those things in order to get where God needs us to be. Listen to this. Separation without devotion to the Lord becomes isolation. But devotion without separation is hypocrisy. And that's what we have to understand. We're a big hypocrite when we say we're on God's side, but we still associate and do all the things we can do in worldly compassion, in worldly fashion. So we have to understand, we have to learn to separate ourselves from those things that are not pleasing in God's eyesight and not carry the Bible or preach hard on Sundays and the rest of the week we do everything we want to do. We have to learn how to live a life that is pleasing to God. So those people after once the Israelites, once they started hearing the word, understanding what was going on, they said, uh, the word tells us that they separate themselves from all the strangers, from all the foreigners that was not in the, what God wanted to do. And then the next thing he says, and they stood and they confessed their sins. Now, that's the big thing. Many times <laughs> we know we're wrong with what we're doing, but we don't want to confess even to God, you know? And that's the main person who we need to be confessing to, to God. We want to say, all right, Lord, please forgive us for all our sins and, 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 and keep on going. But no, we have to confess, call those sins out for what they are. We did them, so why not confess them? But God knows about them anyway. It's not like you're hiding anything from them. So, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not really sure what the point is behind all that. But we need, if, we, if we're that ashamed and call them out, then maybe we shouldn't have done them in the first place. And that's what growth in Christ is all about, that we have to learn how to grow and be able to come back and confess our sins. That's what uh, 1 John tells us, is that we need to confess our sins. He's just and loving enough to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all the righteousness. That's what we have to do. We have to learn how to come back and confess our sins. He said, look what it says, and confess their sins and of their fathers. Briefly put, God elected for himself, not a group of worshiping individuals, but an entire covenant community. His promises were made to the people as one. And when one of the people broke the promise they had made in return, the whole community suffered as is shown in the destruction of Jerusalem and in the exile to Babylon, which faithful Israelites like Jeremiah had to what, share in with the rest. Uh, and what and basically what that saying is, is like the old saying goes, sometimes like the good have to suffer with the bad. Even though that you may not have personally done a lot of things that 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 that, 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 that were brought against the whole nation, the point of it is you're part of the group. You're part of the nation. You're part of the covenant agreement. So when God blesses one, he blesses all. Or when he has to punish all, I mean punish, he punish all simply because as a nation or a group or covenant, you did not 
complete what God asked for you to do. So again, many times the good has to suffer with the bad, simply because we allow other people to take us in directions that we shouldn't go. Kings and the different priests and all the different leaders start falling away from God. And what happens then as a result, what the people generally follow behind them and do the same thing because we don't want to be that sore thumb storm that sticks out and stands out. Because even when that happened with the prophets, what did they do for the prophets? They 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 they, they stoned them, or they, they ran them out of town, or they did imprisoned them, did everything they could to keep their mouth shut because they didn't want to hear what thus says the Lord word of God. But we have to understand, we have to confess, we have to come back, but everybody shares in this this plan that God has. And I can say sometimes when the leadership is wicked, bad, and takes you in a direction, all of us suffer, uh, no matter um, uh, what your position is. And that's why he says, and, and look at the latter part of that, he said, not only did they confess their sins, uh, but the iniquities of their fathers, because it was their fathers who got them in that position. If the people many, many years before them who were sinning and rebelling against God, they sent the whole nation into captivity. So sometimes, like I say, we just have to understand that we have to all get in here and then do this thing together until God delivers us as he did uh, the children of Israel. Now, the rest of the, the scripture is basically a prayer uh, that, that and, and, and most people are not sure whether it was Ezra or one of the Levites that prayed this prayer, but some go either way. But the point of it is the rest of the, the, of the, of the, uh, of the chapter is a big prayer. Well, whoever is to pray now is thanking God for all that he has done for them and brought them through and for who he is. So we're going to get in here and see what the the prayer of, the, of this prayer says uh, about God and and uh, what he says uh, to us today as well, too. Verse 6, it says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heavens, the heavens of heavens, and with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that therein, and thou preservest uh, them all, and the hosts of the heavens worship, worshipest thee. This is what he, this is what the prayer is saying now, because once they start to separate themselves, once they start to to really understand what they need to do, uh, uh, somebody stood up, and this is the prayer that. That was starting to be prayed if you look at uh, uh, verse 4 of chapter 9. And everybody, I mean, when somebody stood up and started to pray. Listen, so 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 first of all, in prayer, as we're going to see him, one of the things that what we call the elements of prayer is recognition. We have to recognize God for who he is and what he has done for us. And this is how uh, this prayer starts off this prayer by helping us understand who God is. He said, for thou art the Lord alone. Thou hast made the heavens and the heavens of heaven. It says, one, out one remarkable aspect of this prayer and a way in which it serves as a model of prayer for God's community even today is the way it tells a story. In this verse, the story begins at creation with God making the skies. Heavens here probably means skies and not heavens as in God's abode. Their host probably refers to the stars and the earth, along with all good things that are filled both the earth and the sky. Then from the time he creates, he preserves all things that he has made, even, it might be implied, through catechism like floods. The prayer also reminds all who hears that the earthly creation God worships God by his very essence, the host of heaven worshipeth thee. So it's kind of hard for me to believe that as we go through life and we see all the great things that we see on this earth. And I've been privileged to see a few things, even going out the country to, to see other areas of the world. And, and you see different wonders and different sights. And, and, and you just can't help but understand there has to be a God who created all of this. Man couldn't have done all this. Man could not put things in order the way God has in creation to make things work in harmonious relationship with each other. But it was only man who came along and really caused the ripple and caused the sin factor to come in that caused everything to change and go in a different direction for which God created. But everything is beautifully 
created by God. As we say, we we at the time now of taping, there's thunderstorms and, and been lightning and different other things that happened. But all that was what God gives us because we need the rain. We need all the things, the cold, the hot, all that it comes because of not only us as humans, but animals and plants and other things around the earth need these things in order to survive. So, and, and, and we see that even God puts animals in, in certain condition, but he makes them conducive to the living quarters that they have to stay in. Everything that God does is in order and it's decent and uh, it is right for human, uh, creation. So the prayer starts off by helping us to understand who God is. Verse seven, let's see what he says in his prayer. He said, Thou the Lord the God, who did his choose Abraham and brought him forth out of Ur unto the Shandines and gave him what the name Abraham, or I should say Abram, and gave him the name Abraham. And then listen to what it said. Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations that have made these. We see this in Genesis 17, Genesis 17 and 5. And this is what God said to Abraham. The prayer in Nehemiah 9 remembers Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel, his former name Abram, which meant exalted father. Uh, but the name of God gives him meaning his father of many. The people are reminded of their roots in that ancient place of Ur among the Shandian people, which God made a covenant with a young man and transformed him into a covenant, covenantal father of promise. If the theme of verse 6 was God creates and preserves, the theme of verse 7 is God chooses and promises. So, uh, again, he, uh, the, the, the prayer is going all the way back from the beginning. He started by saying who God is. Now he starts off by bringing Abraham, who is the father of the, of the, of the Israelites uh, nation and also the father of those who are believers in Christ coming to God through a relationship. So when we pray, we have to... We have to acknowledge God who he is and what he's done and how much, how he's brought us through and what he's done for us. And then also, again, confess our sins, our, our shortcomings. And we'll pick all this up in our, in, our, in our lesson as we go today. So again, this is continuing the prayer. And now let's look at verses 9 and 10 uh, in our lesson. And he says, And did seize the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and hears their cry by the Red Sea, and he showed the signs and the wonders upon Pharaoh and upon all the servants, and for all the people of this land, and thou knewest that they dwelt proudly against them, so didst thou get thee a name as it is this day. Israel's exodus through the Red Sea uh, gave an, an enduring shape to its community. The people remember is in every year on Passover, this was when they commemorated their herald and escape out of slavery across the sea. The sea, the sea should have swallowed uh, them, but instead it swallowed the Egyptians. The Israelites escaped to freedom and, na and nationhood in the land promised to Abraham, and the Jews still celebrate the Passover to remember Exodus to this day. Uh, to this day, so powerful is the remnant remnants of an event that took place more than 3,000 years ago. And let's have in such a glorious history become a source of pride in Israel. The prayer acknowledges that the Egyptians were swallowed up because they knew it not, and they dealt proudly against Israel. The pattern is clear. The one true God will humble those who seek to raise their fame to God-like levels. God alone is worthy to be remembered for his great deeds. So does thou get thee a name as it is this day. So Israel's Lord, Yahweh, is not only creator and preserver, but the one who calls and promises. So God does a lot for all of us, and we can see what he did for Israel, bringing them out of, out of, out of Egypt. Like I say, they got faced between uh, the Red Sea, mountains on one side, and Pharaoh's army was behind them. So they were stuck, as we would say, between a rock and a hard spot. But what did God do? God parted the Red Sea. Many still question about how that happened and, and what happened and what, what really did uh, did they really go through and all that? But if we are Bible believers and Bible readers, we have to understand and believe what the Word of God tells us, that God parted the Red Sea, they walked through on dry land, and once they got across, the, the Egyptian army tried to come behind them, 
And what happened? God caused the water to come back together and he drowned, he drowned the armies uh, in the Red Sea. So God is powerful. God can do things. Then not only that, he, what, he made a name for himself. And that's what, because uh, it says, so didst thou get thee a name as it is in this day, the latter part of verse 10. So God made a name for himself for the wonderful things that he did for Israel. And he makes a name for us today for the wonderful things that he does for us as his followers and believers in Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 30, because now we're going to skip down a whole bunch in the lesson. Verse 30 and 31. It says, Yet many years did thou forbear them and testify against them by the Spirit and thy prophets, talking about the people of Israel, and yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hands of the people of the land. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou did not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. So we see now getting into the people's part. God did a lot, but guess what? The people did a lot too to cause their trouble. And this is what I can't understand about life is that God leads us basically to a promised land. Some of us are living some of our, our best life right now and being able to do the things that we're able to do. Now, everybody cannot do the same thing on the same level, but there are things, places we're going, things we're doing, things we're able to achieve in this life. We're living what I call our best life, what God has done for us uh, throughout uh, the history of mankind and what we do. And even in our own lives, God is really doing great things for us. But the, but the sad part about it is like this, is like to say, like the write, like the prayer of the prayers, we turn against God. It, it's as if the good things that God gives us, we just reject them. We go completely in the other direction which caused God to get angry with us, but in his mercy, what he does, he sends, he sends uh, somebody or he sends his word or he helps us to understand how we are aware of it and falling away, but do we listen? No, we still continue on in, his, in, in our own ways. And then what does God have to do? He has to punish us. That promised land, that good stuff in life, it has to be taken away from us. And we're going to see as we get to the end of the line that sometimes don't always come back uh, like we used to have it because of the things that we that we uh, did to get into that position. So so he, they tell us, that, nevertheless, verse 31, nevertheless, thy great mercy say, thou didst not utterly consume them. And that's what God is so merciful. We should be taken away from him, but away from him. But God still gives us another opportunity to come back and to get back right with him. He said, no, forsake them, but thou art a gracious and merciful God. The prayer now summarizes these events with a reminder of why Israel went into exile. The exile would have been a fresh wound on the consciousness of each one present and a powerful, painful reminder of the discipline of God. The prayer acknowledges that God did, did right in all things, being not only perfectly just, but abundantly merciful, and that the blame for the exile lies solely at the feet of the people themselves. But as, as has always been true for God's children, the acknowledgement of sin and rebellion is the beginning of hope for a better future. And that's something I said, we got to confess our sin. For, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them. Verse 31, the people gathered in Jerusalem this very day were proof of that. Despite the despair of the exile, hope was returning through God's mercy and the repentance he was granting Israel. So we have to understand that uh, uh, we, we, we have to come back and, 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 and acknowledge what we do wrong. We have to understand that, that God, has, I mean, all through the Bible, I just only see good things that God has always wanted for his people. But the thing I also see is his people has always been hard-headed and rebellious and rejected those things. We expect for God to give us all what we want, but then we want to always be to do always what we want and not have to always walk faithfully before God. And it doesn't work like that. God give us the opportunity to come back. He gives us the opportunity to understand the things we're doing wrong. But when we're going on so long, like nation of did, God has to punish us and help us to understand 
that this is not what I want for you. And then sometimes some people are destroyed because of their hard headedness. But then again, as a nation, we can see that God did not destroy Israel, but he brought them back as he promised after 70 years down there in the Babylonian captivity. So we have to understand that God is um, a very uh, powerful God. He will carry out the things that he said he's going to do, and he's right and just in what he says, but he also is merciful too, and that he will have mercy upon us and give us another opportunity. We just have to be smart enough, intelligent enough, and, and humble enough to accept it and move forward. Verse 32 um, and it reads like this. It says, Now therefore our God the great, the mighty and terrible God, who keepeth covenants and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that has come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all that people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Now I want to read verse uh, uh, 32 in the New Living Translation. And it says like this, it says, And now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, do not let all the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us and upon our kings and upon our leaders and our priests and our prophets and our ancestors and all your people from the days when the kings of Assyria first triumphed over them until now. So what happens? God sent the northern kingdom. That's where Assyria was in power. They took uh, the northern kingdom probably 150 years prior to the southern kingdom in the captivity. So God God came and he, 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 he punished all the people that were responsible for those things that caused them to lead the people away, uh, or people of Israel away. And it says, the prayer moving, uh, the prayer's moving and significant climax brings two ideas to the forefront. First, that God is the head of his people who disciplines them for their sins. And the second, that human powers, those responsible for Israel's worship and protection have played a central role in aggrieving sins uh, that led to the discipline. So we have to understand this, is that uh, our leaders, as leaders, we got to hold things together and lead people right. We just can't do any and everything and think it's okay. We have to lead the people right. That's our responsibility. And that's why he talks about the kings and, and the princes and the priests and, and all those people like that who should have known better about coming together and following God's word. But they took the people another way. Uh, for those responsible for Israel worship and protection have played a central role in the grieving sin that led to the discipline. The people confess that God is utterly powerful beyond them in every way and even terrible in a sense are uh, awe-inspiring and holy, not cruel or, or vicious. And here is a mystery of Bible religion from first to last, uh, the God so mighty beyond comprehension so others are uh, and set upon it is also the God who keeps covenants and mercy. God makes promises and keeps them even when the promises made back to him are broken. People can beseech him uh, that their history of trouble not seem little before thee. In the hopes, in the recognition of their suffering and repentance will prompt him to mercy. The people confess their hope that their kings will never fall short of his promise. Uh, the peoples confess their hope that their king will never fall short of his promise. Since the first exile, the guilt lies not only on the leaders, but also on our fathers and on all the people. So really, like I say, uh, most times, no one person can put the finger on the other person for the most part. Because there's a part that all of us play when we start going to the side and away from God's word. That's why, again, it's so important to have proper leadership um, and, 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 and people who are willing to listen to the word of God, follow the word of God and lead the congregation and lead the people in the ways that's right and good before the God and stand for truth and righteousness no matter what. And that's what we have to learn to do. And then we won't find ourselves always in these situations as Israel did, going into punishment 
and then having suffered the great consequences uh, for our hard headedness and our rebellions. Verse 33, and it says, How be it thou art just in all that is brought upon us, but thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Verse 34, neither have our kings, our princes, or our priests, or our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and to thy testimonies, wherein thou didst testify against them. Let's read verse 33 and 34 in the New Living Translation. And it says, every time you punished us, you were being just. We have sinned greatly, and you have gave us only what we deserve. Now, how many times will we confess that we actually got what we deserve? Not many, but in dealing with God, we have to, because God is just, he's fair, and he's right, and, and the reason why we get punished is because we do those things that we should not do. And But like I say, again, even when we break our promises, God still keeps his, and that's the good thing about it. Verse 34 in the New Living Translation, it says, our kings, leaders, priests, and ancestors did not obey your law or listen to the warnings in your commandments and laws. And that's that's how we get off track. Leaders, first of all, go away. Most times, if the people are the problem in the people, the leaders can usually settle that and keep moving and keep moving in a positive direction. But when you have corruption in the leadership and it falls down, and then it starts coming into the people and the people start following along with it, that's when you really get off. That's why again it's so important for us to have Good leadership, stay in your word, and follow the leader and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need to do. And again, when we get these positions, whatever they may be, we have to take them seriously because a lot of people are depending on us, and more specifically, God has put a great responsibility uh, in, our, in our hands. Okay? Verse um, 30, 33, 34. Near the end, um, near the end of the book of Deuteronomy, the people had a ceremony. Uh, we see that in Deuteronomy 27, 11 through 14. Half of Israel tribe stood on Mount Grism to represent the blessings for God of obedience. The other half stood on Mount Ebron to represent curse for disobedience. The Levites declared God's curse and blessings before the people. The Lord had established a godly lifestyle. The people had agreed and bound themselves to the covenant. No one can claim to be unfairly punished. The prayer of the confession acknowledges that the people have chosen Mount Ebal. They have chosen the curse. As a result, God was just to carry out what he promised. God was also merciful in allowing them in return for his faithful remnant of people. So just to sum all that up, what he's saying is, is that God gave the rules and regulations and the commandments and the people agreed to them. He told them what would happen if they followed them and what would happen if they didn't. But again, they agreed to it. So when God's punishment came into their life, it was just, it was fair because they already understood what was going to happen if they did not do the things that God asked for them to do. And the same thing in our lives today. Uh, we need to learn how to follow God's word in order to be able to receive the blessings. Stop blowing, stop messing over, stop rejecting the promised land that God puts in our lives and learn to live according to what he asks us to do so we can continuously to, to, to live in a land flowing with milk and honey or have a life that's rich and full and blessful rather than struggling and, and, and always having hardship. We can do better. Like I said, many of us are living our best lives today and it's because God has blessed us in so many ways. Why throw that away? And why leave it, push it to the side for something less than that? To me, it doesn't make any sense. Let's hurry to the close. The verse 35, he said, But they have not served thee in their kingdom and in thy great goodness uh, that, get, that thou gavest them. And in the large and the fat land which thou gavest them before them, neither turn thee from their wicked works. The community's prayer now brings to light another reason uh, God is justified in disciplining the people. Not only did they break their covenantal promise to him, but they also misused the generosity with which he lavished good things upon them. The fat land of their homes is the kingdom uh, he gave them when they begged for a king to rule them. 
We see that in 1 Samuel 8. However, they have not served thee in their kingdom, neither turn they from their wicked works. Uh, this contrast presents a picture of God's righteousness and Israel's guilt. Again, they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they expect for God to bless. I don't know how we figure God should do that, but in our small minds, we think God still should bless us and then allow us to do what we want to on the side. Let's close this out in verse um, 36. He says, Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gave us our fathers, to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, uh, we are servants in it. And that's the interesting thing. God gave them back, but they still servants to the what the Persian government, the Persian king. Then not only that, after the Persians came, what? The Greeks. And after the Greeks came the Romans. So even though God gave them back the land, they still never had the fullness of it like they did in the days of David and Solomon, when Israel was a very powerful and strong nation. So like I say, sometimes God will bring us back and get us to a certain point. But it may not always be back to our original place that we had, that promised land that we had, because what we rejected those things that God gave to us. And it's sad to see that we would turn so much of God's blessing away that wind up having very little in the end, but just enough to say we got some. I want to read verse 37 and 38 right quick as we close this out. And it says, And the yield is much increase unto the kings, who thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of this, we make a sure covenant to write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests are sealed it. And what he's saying in verse 37 is, God gave us back, but they can't, again, they can't control them. Somebody else is controlling them. Their bodies, all they do, they got the heed to their rules and regulations. They cannot be the free people that they once were. And this is why we sacrifice so much um, when we don't give God uh, what God uh, has for us in this life. Now, let's close this out. What's the takeaway today for me? Uh, let's stop throwing away God's blessings uh, when he gives them to us for something of lesser value. God gives us the promised land. But like Israel so many times, we give it right back away for chasing things in this world that we think that is so much better. But when we get there, we find out that they do us no good. Stay in God's plan, stay in God's hands. Listen to the prayer of this prayer and, and understand all that God has done for us in our life and what he's brought us through. And if we do that, I guarantee you, we'll be a richer and better people. And if we stay and confess our sins and do that which God has us to do, we can get in that promised land and we can stay in that promised land that God has for us, uh, flowing with milk and honey. Thank you. God bless you. This is our lesson today. Hopefully I've had said something today that would encourage you and strengthen you along this way. And again, as I always say, if God gives us this opportunity uh, to come back again, hopefully it will, that you be safe. God bless you and you take care. And if it God's will, we'll see you soon. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.